In one of Paul's letters, he made a simple and yet disturbing statement. He said, and I read it, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and some have even died. Now, when you think about that for a moment, if you were in that congregation, which was probably somewhat larger than ours, and realizing as you cast your eye about that there were people, definitely, who were sick and had been that way for a long time in spite of the prayers of the church, and and people that had you had hoped would get well and that you had prayed for and even shed tears over and that they had died. Then you get a letter from Paul saying, Now, for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and some sleep or have died. Would you be interested in knowing what the cause was? Would you be concerned about seeing if there was something you could do about the cause, if, if there was some change that we could make as a, as a church or as a person or individual or what have you, if there were anything, something to do about it, would you want to? to read the whole segment, if you'd like, with me. In 1 Corinthians 11, we won't read all of it, but just the part around this. He says in verse 29 of 1 Corinthians 11, For he that eats and drinks unworthily, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Now the definition of discern, before I give it to you, what do you think it is? I think if I were to ask most people, I'd say, well, discerning, let's see. Uh, to discern something is to see it, or to understand it, to perceive it. And indeed, that is the secondary definition of the word, but it is secondary, and it's derived from the primary meaning of the word, which is to separate a thing mentally from another or others to recognize as separate or different. To recognize as separate or different, and as a matter of fact, that is quite precisely the meaning of the Greek word which is translated by our translators, discern. Not separating or recognizing as different from something else, the Lord's body. Now, I was a member of a, a Protestant church for many years before I was ever a part of this church, and I kept the Lord's Supper uh, countless times because the Lord's Supper was not merely something we did once a year. It was something that some churches did quarterly, some did more often than that. Some, you know, whatever their particular congregation decided to do, that's what they did. And so I observed the Lord's Supper in many cases, and I had in my mind a very, very clear idea about the blood of Jesus Christ and about Christ's death cleansing me from all sins. In the Baptist Church, for example, there is a clear distinction made in the, in the serving of the bread and the wine. There's a little unleavened wafer that is served, and you take that, and then the, 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 uh, the actually in that case, grape juice is served, and you take that, and it is spoken of, but I can never recall at any time hearing anyone explain to me, or to really make a distinction with the Lord's body. It was treated as though, even though there were the two things involved in it, they were part of one whole sacrifice, which indeed they absolutely were. But I never had in my mind any any discernment, and of course the discernment we're speaking of here, it says, to separate a thing mentally from another or others, and to recognize it as separate and different. Now, as I said, I understood that Christ shed his blood. I sang songs about it. I sang a song, Are You Washed in the Blood of the Lamb? You know, and it's a good old song, you know, camp meeting type of song. There's power in the blood. You used to love that one. You could really get your, you know, diaphragm under that one. There's power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Uh, that's a, a good old song. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that blood, lose all their guilty things. I understood that from as long as I can recall any awareness of the Christian faith at all. I have understood that. But for some reason, I did not discern. I did not make a separation or a distinction in my mind somehow of the Lord's body. I did not see that. I can remember also in the military, uh, when I would, you know, chapel in the big church, and they would be having communion there, and I would partake of communion. Probably some uh, Baptist ministers would not approve of my having taken communion from a chaplain that uh, did it this way. But the custom there was to dip a wafer in the wine and to put it on my tongue, and I sort of partook of the wine and the bread at the same time. Once again, showing the unity of the sacrifice, the wholeness of the sacrifice, that Jesus' body and blood were both shed.
shed for me, that I might be forgiven. But there was no discernment of the Lord's body. And you see, Paul comes back to us and, and really draws a very strong uh, distinction. Now, I will admit that there is a, an appeal to that idea of, of, the, of the unity of Christ's sacrifice. The idea, in fact, of actually dipping the wafer in the wine and partaking of both of them at the same time, the idea of wholeness, unity, has a very powerful appeal. And yet Paul draws a very heavy negative inference from the failure to separate those two things. And the inferences have to do with people in the church remaining sick, and some of them not being healed, and some of them dying. Now, I, you know, I don't want to pretend this isn't in the book. It's right here. And I don't necessarily want to say I've got all the answers to it today, but I think it might be worth a little bit of time for us to ponder this as the Passover comes up tomorrow night, if indeed we are to discern the Lord's body and to try somehow to understand the relationship of it to this service that we are going, of which we are going to partake. Jesus' sacrifice did not take place at an instant. He died in an instant. You know, death is something that is not really long and drawn out. It takes place. You are either dead or you are alive. There's such thing as being half alive. His death took place at an instant, but his sacrifice was extended over several hours. Now, if you'll turn back to the 26th chapter of Matthew, I want to point out a few things that we might see here. First of all, one of the things that Jesus experienced, one of the very first things that he experienced as a, a pain on this night, was the fact that as the soldiers came to arrest him, after the initial skirmish, every one of the disciples left him, forsook him, as the word is used here, and fled. You know, it's very important to us when we're in a time of trial to have people around to support us. It's very important to have people sometimes even share in the trial with us. If we are in pain knowing that someone else even is suffering pain at the same time is kind of helpful, or knowing that someone is losing sleep while we are in pain is in itself a meaningful thing. Even though we ourselves would urge them, no, no, you go home, you go ahead, you get some sleep. Something deep down inside of us says, boy, I am glad you're here. And I am glad to, to know that you're willing to lose some sleep while I am not only losing sleep but going through this agony that I am now going through. So he had to experience that, first of all, that he had to go into this thing absolutely alone. Next, the first suffering, the first humiliation, the first pain that Jesus experienced, was not at the hands of the Romans. It was not even just at the hands of the Jews. It was at the hands or in the face or right in front of a son of Aaron, the high priest, the one who was supposed to represent him, who was the one who actually carried blood into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement every year and sprinkled it for the blood and the sins of all the people, who actually represented the work of Jesus Christ it was in this man's presence, in his court, that Jesus first experienced these indignities. The high priest asked the people standing around, What do you think about him? And they answered and said, He is guilty of death. Verse 67. Then did they spit in his face. They buffeted him. Others smote him with the palms of their hands. And the other, another version tells us they actually covered his eyes, and they whacked him, they slapped him across the face. And he said, Now, you're a prophet. Tell us who hit you. He mocked him. Now, the question that I want you to contemplate at the moment is, was this really necessary? Was this, was this called for? Was this something that had to happen? We know that Jesus had to die for our sins, right? We understand that. I, I have understood that, as I said, for as long as I have been a Christian, that it was necessary that Jesus die for my sins. All right. He, but he was going to be crucified. He was going to have to go through that indignity. He was going to have a spear thrust into his side. Wasn't it enough that he just die? Was this necessary? Is this just something that man threw in? Or is this something that God intended? If you'll turn back to the 50th chapter of Isaiah, I want to point out something to you. It's a familiar verse if you've ever heard Handel's Messiah, or if you've read this much before. In Isaiah, the 50th chapter, in verse 5, The Lord has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. Neither turned the way back. I gave my back to the smiters, and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Do you 
realize that this was put here generations before in the full knowledge that Jesus Christ was going to come to this earth, carry out his ministry, and when the time came, he would make a decision, a conscious, viable, I mean, a living decision to give his back to the smiters. He did not, they was not taken from him. It wasn't something that they decided to do regardless of what he wanted or what his will or what his plan was. He actually gave his back to the smiters. He gave his cheeks to people who took up and pulled out parts of his beard. And he did not hide his face from shame, humiliation, and from being spit in which he could have done, obviously. But it was manageable. And you have to realize, then, that this beginning of humiliation and this beginning of suffering at the hands of the high priest of the Most High God was part of the plan. It was initially here. It is a part of what happened to the body of Jesus Christ, as opposed to what was later to happen when his blood was poured out. This whole segment continues to hear, and it is a, a moving and powerful segment, but I want you to pass on down to chapter 27. It is also worth noting that just prior to this, he had known what was happening, and he had been denied by one of his very closest disciples. And Peter said to Peter, you're robbed, and he said, no, you're well, I'm not. Yes, you are. I've seen him there, and he swore and, and, and used profanity and said, I tell you, I don't know the man. How do you feel about that? One of your best friends, where you say, hey, I don't even know who he is. I, I never met that woman. That's a part of the experience of what Jesus Christ went through on this night. When the morning was come, the chief priests and elders of the people, chapter 27, verse 1, took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Judas, at this point of time, realizing what had happened, repented after a fashion, and went and threw the money at their feet and went out and hanged himself. Then down in verse 19, when Pilate was sit down in the judgment seat, his wife sent to him, saying, Don't you have anything to do with that just man? I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Barabbas was a murderer, a murderer and a robber, and they wanted Barabbas. The governor answered and said, well, which of the two do you want me to release? And they said, Barabbas. And Pilate said to them, well, what am I supposed to do then with Jesus, who is called Christ? And they all said, well, let him be crucified. These were his people. He came to his own, and his own received him not. They were the Jews. Of all people, you know, being killed by the Romans, being rejected by the Romans was one thing. But he wasn't rejected by them. He was rejected by his own. And the governor said, Why? What evil has he done? And they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. And Pilate saw he could prevail nothing, but that rather a whole tumult was made. He took water right out in front of everybody and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this innocent person, this just person. Be you to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. What a tragic, tragic thing. And yet, all of these people were willing to accept his blood upon themselves rather than see a robber and a thief die, rather than see Jesus released. But, of course, it was a part of the plan. Then he released Barabbas to them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. I won't try to explain to you today in graphic detail what scourging is. It is a whipping with something similar to a cat of nine tails, only worse, and it goes on and on and on. It was not administered by the Jews who were limited in the kind of corporal punishment they could impose. It was, at the Jews' instigation, done by the Romans who could whip you with it until you died if they chose to do so. In this case, they chose not. But they left him there, almost you know, a bleeding, bloody hulk at this point. And then it says the soldiers of the governor took him into the common hall, gathered under him the whole band of soldiers, and they stripped him. And they put on him a scarlet robe. 
And when they had planted a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, made fun of him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and took the reed and hit him on the head with it. After that, they had mocked him. They took the robe off him and put his own name on him and led him away to crucify him. Now, was all this necessary? Did all this stuff really have to happen? Was it needful? Did he go through the scourging? Did he have to endure this additional humiliation? Was the crown of thorns important somehow in all this? I want you to turn back to Isaiah one more time. To the prophet Isaiah, chapter 52. For here, generations again before the Messiah was to come, what he was to do, and in very large measure why he was to do it, was presented to us. In Isaiah, the 52nd chapter, we're told, Depart ye, depart ye, verse 11, go out from thence, touch no unclean thing, go out of the midst of her, be clean, you that bear the vessels of the Lord. For you shall not go out by haste, nor by flight, and the Lord will go before you, and the Lord God of Israel will be your rear guard. Then he says in verse 13, Behold, my servant, and the context is very clearly talking about Jesus Christ and what he is to do. My servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were astonished at you, they were startled, they, they did not understand what they were seeing. His visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Now, did it have to be so? Apparently so. For here, as I say, generations before, the Holy Spirit speaks through a prophet who begins to talk about the sacrifice of, 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 of God's servant, who is going to be seen to be his son. And we are told his visage, his appearance, was so marred that he was well nigh unrecognizable, which probably happened during the scourging. And the scourging that took place at the hands of the Roman soldiers was a part of the original plan. He gave his back to the smiters. He gave his cheeks to those that slapped him and pulled off the hair from him. And he did not even turn his face away from spitting. He accepted it. He took it. It was voluntary. Why? Was it necessary that you be in the witness so you could be resurrected? Well, wasn't his death and burial and his resurrection, wasn't that sufficient? to raise you from the dead? Is not his death in his grace sufficient? One would certainly think so. And yet here, in the plan, this must seemingly must take place. Then read on in chapter 53. Who is this believed, I report? People will not believe this. To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised, hated, and rejected of men. Was he? When Pilate brought him out before all the people, and he says, now this is the time of year when I am going to release one person to you. You have a choice. Here is Jesus of Nazareth, who has done no wrong. Here is Barabbas, who is a murderer, a thief, a robber, and a leader of sedition. Which one of these two men do you want me to release? And the whole crowd said, Give us the beast. Give us the monster. Give us the murderer. And here Jesus is listening to this. They hated him so much. They despised him so much. They rejected him so completely that they would accept a dirty, foul, rotten, murdering beast be released rather than Jesus Christ. And it was all in the plan. It was all there. It was all intended. He continues to say he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Those words basically mean pain and sickness. He was a man of pain and acquainted with sickness. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was hated, and we esteemed him not. They all, as I say, despised him, but, but when he had been beaten and all this, you know, he was the kind of, when, when you'd look at him, you wouldn't want to look. You would want to hide your eyes. You would want to turn your face around where you didn't have to see. Surely, 
he has borne our pain and carried our sickness. Yet we did have seen him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Well, maybe it was because of something he had done. Maybe he deserved this somehow. Maybe he should have been crucified. And yet we are left with a contrast between him and Barabbas as the choice that ought to be released. We have seen him stricken, smitten of God, afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon us. That this is talking about spiritual healing of the soul as well as the healing of the body. But don't ever think for a moment that it doesn't have to do with the sicknesses and the diseases that might in one way or another affect us. Now, there was a time in the church when there was a an in vogue a concept of physical sin. That if somebody was sick, well, it's because he had committed a physical sin of some sort or other. It was the same mentality that the disciples had when they came and said, Well, now, Jesus. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? They had to think in terms of that blindness as a result of some specific, traceable, definable sin. And Jesus said, nobody. It wasn't him. It wasn't his parents. This man was born blind, so my glory might be revealed in him, if you're able to understand what that means. He rejected that out of him. And yet, there, this, this idea of physical sin, it was a physical sin. I would have thought adultery was a physical sin, wouldn't you? It would be one of the Ten Commandments. You know, this says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Is eating too much white sugar mentioned somewhere as a part of the commandments of God? Is it somewhere in the statutes and judgment? Is it somewhere back in, in the revelations in the New Testament or elsewhere of God's will and what man's supposed to be? No. How can it be a sin then? It's not. A sin. It may be a, a mistake. You may somehow affect your health, but it has nothing to do with what this is talking about. This is talking about transgressions or cutting across. Cutting across what? The law of God. It's talking about iniquity. What's iniquity? It's lawlessness. What law? The Ten Commandments. Let's start right there. It's talking about lying. It's talking about stealing. It's talking about coveting. It's talking about dishonoring your father and your mother. It's talking about taking God's name in vain. It's talking about breaking the Sabbath day. It says that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The physical affliction to Christ's body was because you and I have broken the Ten Commandments. But there's more. It says the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought like a lamb to the slaughter and like a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opens not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. You see, it was you and I who were supposed to suffer the pain. It was you and I who were supposed to be sick. It was you and I who were supposed to have diseases upon our body because of broken law. But Jesus Christ bore our sin in his body. Is disease and sickness in the world because of sin? Sure it is. Does breaking God's law lead to sickness? Of course it does. Is everyone who is sick guilty of breaking God's law? Whether they're sick or not, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And it is the height of self-righteous foolishness to go searching around for some sin that caused one of our poor brethren to be sick. Or it would imply, I'm not sick because I haven't done what you have done. The truth is, I may have done worse than you have done, and I'm not sick, and you are. Oh, yeah. We know that, that don't we? I mean, common sense tells you that, doesn't it? We have that right down the core of our being. And yet, don't you ever make a mistake about or misunderstand or sell short what he says here. Jesus Christ cares that people on the face of this planet suffer 
and are in pain and are sick and are diseased and die untimely deaths, leaving people behind them grieving with great tears running down their cheeks. He cares very, very much. And he bore those pains in his body. He received those strokes in his back that you and I should have had on ours. And there is no reason why you and I should have to carry ourselves what he has already carried for us. People speculate about why Jesus Christ healed the sick. You know, they think, well, he was a compassionate man. He felt sorry for those people. He wanted to demonstrate his power, you know, also. Really? Do you think then that those people he did not heal in that one area that he went into that the Bible mentions was because uh, he didn't feel sorry for those people? You think he went into an area and here were a bunch of sick folk and he didn't feel sorry for them, whereas he did feel sorry for these others? Was he merciful upon these other people, but he, but he just decided not to be merciful to these people? It's an interesting thought, isn't it? Was it because he had power down here that he didn't have power up there? Well, maybe it's because of their unbelief. Well, we know Jesus did heal people who didn't believe. In fact, he has healed people who didn't even know it was coming. Hadn't any thought of it crossed their mind. One man is waiting there by Peter, and then Peter turns and looks at him, and he slips out of his hand expecting to receive alms. And look what he got. He got to walk for the first time. Isn't that something? His faith, his belief, he didn't, he didn't know he was anything there to have faith in. Continuing, though, in, in Isaiah 53, he made his grave with the wicked and the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He, that is, the Lord, has put him to pain. Have you ever thought about that? It pleased the Lord, one, one translation says, it pleased the Lord to crush him physically. Just crush him. Why do you suppose that was so? Well, in the first place, the language is probably not the best for a 20th century leader to say it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It's probably more accurate to say it was God's will. It was part of his plan. It was his intent to bruise him. It was not an accident. It didn't just happen because evil men did it. It wasn't what God wanted. It wasn't because men that things got out of hand. It was a part of the original plan of God that the body of Jesus Christ should be bruised for you and for me. It is that part of his sacrifice which Paul says, many of you are weak and sickly because you have not discerned or separated or distinguished the Lord's body. Where Isaiah is quoted by Peter as saying, by his stripes, you are healed. Now, that's really a, a startling thing to have to think about, that it pleased God to bruise him so that all these things he went through were a part of the original plan and intent of God. When you shall make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He says in verse 12 of Christ, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the proud, because he has poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors. transgressors. He bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. How do you make his soul an offering for sin? Well, when you repent of your sins and you come to someone in the ministry and you say, I want to be baptized, you have made a decision to make Jesus Christ's life an offering for your sins. Because when you are in the waters of baptism, you are going to be asked, have you repented of your sins of the transgression of God's holy and righteous law? And you're going to say, I have. And you're going to be asked, do you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? And you're going to have to say, I do. And it's at that moment of time that you really do make his soul an offering for sin, and then you go down the waters of baptism being buried with him so that you can actually be raised with him to walk in newness of life. That is a moment when you make his soul an offering for sin. There is another moment in a way. It's a renewal, I suppose, and it'll happen tomorrow night when you will sit and you will 
have someone pass around to you a little wafer of unleavened bread. Someone's going to read out some of the scriptures I've already read and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. This eat in remembrance of me. And you'll partake of that, and you will say, I accept the sacrifice of Christ's body. And you can, you can discern, you can know at that moment of time that it is a different thing from what you are about to do as you partake of his life, his blood. We'll pass around the wine, and you will partake of the wine as well, and you will be saying by that, I accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for my sins, in total, in all. You know, there is another moment in the way where we do this. And the description of it is recounted back in James, the fifth chapter of the book of James, and verse 14. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. That's a, is that a promise? Can you, you know, shall we equivocate on this? I, I think that's a promise, isn't it? Isn't that something that you can really depend on? The prayer of faith shall save the sick. Now, there is the problem with this, and why does sometimes they bother some people? Is they will say to themselves, okay, fine, then I guess that means that everybody who is prayed for and doesn't get well must not have had sufficient faith. No, it doesn't mean that. And I don't want to confuse you, but if you'll just bear with me again a moment, I'm going to explain to you what I mean. He says, the prayer of the Lord shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if he has committed sins, if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. All right, there are a couple of things I want you to understand. One, this is a promise. It is not an unconditional promise. It is a qualified promise. It is conditional upon faith. Are those not healed lacking in faith? Jesus Christ went into the Garden of Gethsemane on the night before he was to be crucified. And he went off by himself and he made a prayer to God. He said, Father... If it is possible that this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus Christ prayed that that cup might pass from him. It did not. Was that because he lacked faith? No one's willing to say that, are they? And yet here is a prayer that was made, which in a sense was not answered. And yet it was a qualified prayer, wasn't it? He said, nevertheless, Not my will, but your will be done. Faith requires three things. And this scripture about, you know, if you're sick, you call for the elders of the church and let them come and anoint you. Is it that faith, prayer of faith that you're going to receive involves three things. It involves, first of all, belief. A belief in Jesus Christ, a belief in his power, a belief that he can heal you, a belief that he can raise you right up off that bed of pain. A belief that you can walk, though you maybe haven't walked in years. A belief that you can see, even though you are blind. To know that he is there and he can do it. It involves something else again, and you cannot say you have faith unless this is present. It involves an acceptance of God's will. You have to be able to accept God's will. Otherwise, how can you have faith? If, for example, it is not God's will for reasons that you do not know to heal you at this moment of time, why would that ever be? Well, I could give you one good reason. There was a man named Hezekiah, and God sent a prophet to him and said, Set your house in order. You're going to die. You're not going to live. And you hit him like a ton of bricks. The prophet turned around and began to walk out. He turned his face to the wall and began to pray and sob, and with tears running down his face, and begged God to let him live. And God said, Okay. Then Isaiah back yet to see him again. He says, okay, God has added 15 years to your life. In the latter part of his life, Hezekiah turned away from God. What do you prefer? 15 more years of life? Or to let, have God tell you, well, set your house in order. We come at the end of your life right now. It's my will. It's time for you to go. I'll give you more if you want it. But I'll tell you, when the end of that comes, you will not be in the kingdom. Which would you choose? Easy choice perhaps. That's the second thing you have to have if you're going to claim you have faith. There's one more. And it is so obvious that it almost, you know, you wonder how in the world a person could ever miss. And he said, faith without works is dead. I remember once we were preparing for a ministerial conference in Pasadena. This was many, many years ago. 
At that time, it seemed like every ministerial conference, we had all sorts of questions about medical treatment and medical doctors and what you could do and couldn't do. Could you sew up a wound? Could you set a broken bone? Everybody knew that. But there were all sorts of other things. People wondered if you could do this or can you do that or can you do the other thing. Some poor fellow up in Wichita, when I was passing through there in 1961 as a brand new minister, had broken his leg so badly that they could not set it except anyway except surgery and by putting a pin in it. I had to call Pasadena to find out if that was all right. Well, I, there was, we were getting ready for a ministerial conference, and uh, somebody had that was asked, saying, Mr. Armstrong, we need to put the question of healing on the agenda because we have several, a lot of questions coming in the ministers about medical treatments and what can be done and what cannot. And Herbert Armstrong turned around and looked at him like they were crazy. He said, what's the matter with you? He said, the principle is so simple, why doesn't everybody understand it? He said, God will not do for you what you can do for yourself. You know, and I blinked. You know, I was a more mature minister by this time. So I blinked, and I said, uh, uh, does he understand the implications of what he just said? And I believe he did. I really believe he did. I, he was so far removed, frankly, from the rank and file people in the church, I don't think he understood the implications as they would perceive them. I really don't. But he said, God will not do for you what you, will, what you can do for yourself. There is absolutely no conflict between faith that God will heal you and doing the very best for yourself that you possibly can or that a doctor or some other specialist can do for you. There is no conflict at all. God will not do for you what you can do for yourself. He expects that if you've got a broken bone that it be set. He expects if you've got a rotten tooth that's poisoning your system that you get it pulled out. And he wants you to go to find somebody that will do the absolute very best job of pulling it out and hopefully will not get you infected in the process and be able to treat you if you do. That's all. The Bible speaks of bombs. It speaks of poultices. It speaks of doing things for yourself that you can do. There is no conflict between medical science as a generality and faith as a generality. There may be some specifics in it that a person will have some problems with, but we're not going to worry about those today. God assumes that we have enough sense somehow to know the sort of things we ought to do and the sort of things we ought not to do. Faith. I want you to turn back to Matthew 27 one more time. Matthew, the 27th chapter. This time, in verse 34. They gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall, or wine mingled with, mingled with myrrh, I think one of the translations puts it, which basically was a painkiller. It was a mild anesthetic. It was something to maybe give him just what it took to get through the initial shock of what was going on here. He turned it down. He would not drink of it. Apparently, he was determined to experience the full thing. Then they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. They parted my garments among them, and they cast them upon my, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. Did this all have to happen? Did Jesus, when he came down to the end of all this, have to come to the place where he cried out and screamed and said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because in the last moment, God did. Psalm 26, 22, and verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The words that he spoke on the cross were written hundreds and hundreds of years before by David. It was all a part of the plan. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but you don't hear. I cry in the night season. I am not silent. But you are holy, O thou that inhabits the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried to you, and you delivered them. They trusted, and were not confounded. But I am a worm, and no man, a reproach of men, despised by the people. Everyone that sees me laughs me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted in the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delights in him. But you are he that took me out of the womb. You did make me hope when I was on my mother's breasts. I was cast upon you from the womb. You are my God from my mother's belly. Don't be far from me. Trouble is near. There is no one to help. It's the cry of a lonely man. Left alone forsaken by all those that he had trusted or depended upon for all this time. He says, they, I am poured out, verse 14, like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It's melted in the midst of my bowels. Do you think Jesus experienced no dread, no fear of what was going to happen to him? 
that there was no sweating to be done about this thing tomorrow morning. We're told his sweat was like great drops of blood as he prayed in agony over this whole thing. This is part of what he had to say. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, my tongue cleaves to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. And oddly enough, dogs in biblical parts among the prophets was a term they used for false prophets. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count my bones. They look and stare at me. They part my garments among them. And they cast lots upon my clothing. What a tragic thing. And yet, it was all a part of the plan. It was all a part of what God had intended. Now, I want you finally to turn back with me one more time to 1 Corinthians 11, where we started. 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, and see if we can maybe get a little bit of a grip on what this is about before tomorrow night. He said to them, For that which I have received of the Lord, I have received of the Lord that which I have delivered unto you. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he said, he broke, broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you do eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Does that sober us up just a little bit? He said, Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread, and drink of that cup. For he that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Unworthily. Can you ever be worthy to partake of the Passover? Well, in the first place, the verb is, it's an adverb, it's unworthily, and it has to do with partaking of the Passover in an unworthy manner. But it's not talking merely about arrogance, I mean, about, I'm sorry, about gluttony or about drunkenness as a part of the unworthiness, let's say, in partaking of the Passover. It's talking about arrogance. It's talking about hatred. It's talking about animosity toward other human beings. It's talking about selfishness. It's talking about an unrepentant spirit that fails to remember what Christ suffered for us that fails to discern the sacrifice of his body. Notice that after he says, if you partake of it unworthily, you, you actually take judgment to yourself because you do not dis discern or distinguish the Lord's body. And you know, the awareness of the suffering of Christ, the awareness that that suffering was due to me. I had actually earned it. I actually had it all accumulated up and on record, but that he did it in my place should really put me in a frame of mind when I come to the Passover to partake of that, that there is no room for hatred of any other human being on the face of the earth. No room for envy. And how could I find in that heart room for animosity and for bitterness or for strife with another human being? There's no room for that. Not at that time. Not at the Passover. Can you partake of the Passover worthily? Sure you can. Verse 28 says, let a man examine himself. Examine himself. All you've got to do to partake of the Passover worthily is to take a few moments, sometime between now and tomorrow night, and you take a good long look at yourself. You think about what you are. And be sure that if you come to the Passover, you come to the Passover in a repentant spirit. You know, if you're not baptized, there's no time of the year like right now to take a good, hard, long look at yourself and listen to Peter's words where he said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. No one should take of the Passover who has not been baptized. Because, you see, if you have fulfilled anything in your life to where you can approach the Passover as you should, you ought to have been baptized as well. There's absolutely no reason not to, because you are repentant. Believe it or not, you can be worthy in the sight of God. But that worthiness 
is from Jesus Christ.